Henry Gross schools us on the history of comedy. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. One of my favorite songs from 1976 was the song Shannon. Yes, a song about the dead dog. I couldn't get it out of my head. I sang it all the time. I had it in every form you could possibly have it in. When I married my first wife, Lynn, I wanted to name our first daughter Shannon, but my first wife didn't like the name. So when I met my second wife, my first wife came up to me and said, well, you finally got your Shannon. It's always been a name that's been you know, important to me in my life, and I'm glad I'm married to a Shannon now. I told Henry Gross that story, found it was comical. And speaking of that, I found Henry Gross an incredibly funny, witty man with a rich love for comedy. By the way, was there ever a possibility that Henry Gross would have been a comedian? Um, well, to tell you the truth, yeah, I played the Catskill Mountains. Well, it's a funny story because I played in the Catskill Mountains and um, I was there one night and uh, I went to somebody said to me when I, I was really young, I was up 13 or 14. And the guy that booked us said, hey, kid with the cigar, you know, you want to see how this is really done? And I said, you know, he says, come see Billy Eckstein's show tonight at some other hotel. So he, he had he, he was putting on Billy Eckstein. And so I went over to see the great jazz singer, Billy Eckstein. And when I got there, I was backstage doing what I always do, which is, you know, tell horrible jokes to people, you know, keep going. So, uh, but the comic didn't show up. So this guy sends me out. You know, I said, you know, he says to me, you think you're so funny? Go, go be funny go for, for five minutes. And you went? Minutes. Yeah. They didn't even know I was on. They were too busy eating. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was humiliating. And so, you know, I'm, I'm out there and I'm doing this thing, and you know, and I'm, you know, and it was, and I thought, wow, this is a really, really rough business, you know. I mean, I, I, to tell you how it went, I was 14 years old and I was impotent for 30 days after that gig. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it was it, comedy is not is not for the uh, the meek. I mean, also, I wanted to be happy, and and, and comedians are generally not so happy when you meet can we ever meet i met a lot of comedians up there it's not something it's like you meet musicians and they're like you know wow what do we you know and you meet comics and it's you know it's yeah. there's a there's an anger there and you know um you can do that in your but you slip that stuff in your shows i mean you can oh well you know i mean i can't stop i mean how can i stop i mean i've stuck but i've studied comedians and like when you say you can't go back and know it all well but you can, you know, if you, if you, I mean, I'm always amazed and all these people who will look, these movies are, look, I'm not going to, there's no such thing, blanket thing covering everything. There's always good and, and there's bad. But in general, a lot of these romantic comedies that come out now, they're just tripe. I mean, they're unwatchable and they're unwatchable because they're written by these people that, you know, uh, these Harvard graduates that, as I say, never took a punch, never bought a lunch. You know, they, they don't know anything about the street. No one ever smashed them in the face for no reason at all, except they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They don't get it. And they don't really, so there's no grit. There's no, it's just fake. And the fakeness, it's, it, it's I, I, I compare it to the distortion from the loud volume they put on CDs now. You can't listen to, how can you make a Jimmy, Jimmy Reed record too, too, too bright to listen to? The answer is you stuff bright lights big city so loud that it, it hurts your ears you can't listen to it at, at, at one db you can't listen to it it hurts your ears yeah. so they find a way to ruin it and, and they miss the whole point how can you talk about comedy if you don't know the work of charles chaplin you know if you don't know who the laurel and hardy all of it yeah. all of laurel and hardy every moment of it even the documentaries about them if you i mean right behind me here is everything Abbott and Costello ever did, everything by the Three Stooges, everything yeah. by Monty Python, everything, um, all the British television, all the Charlie Chans, the gangsters, the, the you know, the boxes and boxes of, I mean, I can't even go through, it's all over the house. I mean, it's, it's all the Sherlock Holmes, you have to, and then you go from, you know, you go from Basil Rathbone, you go to Jeremy Brett, you know, and then you go on to the next one. You've got to know this stuff if you love the thing, it, once you go through all of the great Hollywood, and once you know what they mean when they say, what is this? It's the stuff dreams you're made of. You know, the Maltese Falcon. Once you know that, 
then you've got to go to British films and you've got to start watching Richard Burton films from when he was 20 years old. The, the Last Days of Darwin. You need to see these films or else you have no, I'm not interested in what you have to say yeah. because I've heard it already. Yeah. And, and if you want to make some sort of melange of all that stuff that's your own version, you have to be aware of it because otherwise you're writing stuff that you come up with a title. Well, titles, people use the same titles. It's hard to get away I can't from remember that. titles anymore. No, people... You movies? You see, you'd remember mine. Let's open a bottle and wine. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but, you know, I'm, you know I have one about a, a, a girl with multiple <laughs> personalities called uh, I Don't Know How to Tell Her Apart. But anyway, you know, but you have to come up with your own things and, and <laughs> to come up with your own things you need a great knowledge and respect I mean I, I, how could you venture into comedy without knowing all of W.C. Fields and the Marx Brothers and you know the obvious people Stephen Wright who has worked his way up to the highest level you know a, a guy who in the middle of all those brilliant jokes does a really kind of dark one and he looks at the audience and he says it wasn't like the other ones was it <laughs> makes a joke of his whole gig and that's the beauty of it that's like great writing I mean it's Woody Allen's done that for years in his great movies you know these ideas that he comes up with Zelig who would come up with this the guy walking off the screen in the purple rose of Cairo the guy going he knows that it, there's a possibility his adopted son that the mother might be bad in mighty Aphrodite so he goes and changes her life so his son can meet his mother and be proud of her I mean these are these are people thinking at the highest level of not only comedy, but of they're, they're the philosophers of our time. Yeah. They're great. And, and you can't, you know, you said something earlier that was very, very true about people. And we skipped over it. And, and I wanted to say something about it is that, that baseball is fair and music and art is not. In baseball, you could kill 50 people, you know, in the street. And, and be on film, and, but if you can hit the ball 425 feet, they're going to give you 50 million dollars and get you out of that legal problem, because nobody cares who you killed if you hit the ball. That's the world today. But music, that's why I, I always loved baseball because it's a true well before steroids because it was a true sport. You know, I mean, those guys were unbelievable. Jackie Robinson, you know, I mean, I have Jackie Robinson memorabilia all over the place, as I do for, you know, I have my Brooklyn Dodgers ball with Roy Campanella and all those. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, my father, yeah, I went to, I went to Ebbets Field one time. Can't remember when, July 14th, 1957, where the Dodgers beat the Milwaukee Braves 3-2 to two on a home run on the bottom of the ninth by Gil Hodges, who lived around the corner from me and mentored me. Used to, on his way to church, would stop by my house and ask me to play him whatever I was working on. Now, you practice really hard when Gil Hodges might stop by, and you want to have something to play him. So I'd learn to play, you know, that'll be the day, the guitar part. I mean, because Gil and the kids in the neighborhood would go, you know, Henry's talking to Gil, Gil's talking to Henry, you know? And it was amazing, because he would go to Our Lady Help Christian's Church right on the corner, and you know, he lived, literally two blocks behind me. He lived on Bedford Avenue between M&N &M and Brooklyn, and I was on 28th Street. And so Gil would sit down on the, on the stoop. You know what that meant to me as a kid? Yeah. I had no confidence. I was this schleppy little kid, and here's Gil Hodges giving me the time of day, sit down there for 10 minutes, 15 minutes sometimes, and I'd ask him questions and all. You know, and then I do this, I do this show called One Hit Wanderer, and uh, it's a 90-minute scripted show, and it's got films and things, and I talk about this in the show. And, it, you know, the kill thought I was pretty good. The kids in my neighborhood, you know, they would say, you know, you, you suck. And it would lead to fights. Anything could lead to fights in my neighborhood because everybody was trying to, always trying to show you how tough they were, you know. And, they, you know, they didn't like that Gil was sitting with me. It was, you know, it was an amazing time. Brooklyn at that time. That's why all the comics came out of there. Yeah. You know, maybe a couple that will that will wander, wander that will wandering lost wound up in New Jersey, but the the but they all came from around there. I mean, you look at all the great comics; they were all mostly Brooklyn guys, because it was Buddy, the Buddy Hackett's, the Mel Brooks's, because it was so Woody Allen, and because it was so impossible <laughs> to exist there, and yet so perfect. Yeah. So Woody Allen, and because it was so 
impossible <laughs> to exist there, and yet so perfect. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos, and go to henrygross.com, by the way, and our website, rockhistorymusic.com. I'm John Bowden. Mm -hmm.